It's a big day. It's turkey day. Everything sort of revolves around the turkey, even though it's notoriously everybody's least favorite thing. I prefer my bird to be simple and perfect. And by perfect, I mean like juicy, delicious, golden, but also just like perfectly seasoned. I'll say it once, I'll say it again. If you've roasted a chicken, you can roast a turkey and they don't have to be that different. It doesn't have to be so scary. If you own a wire baking rack, this is a really good time to use it. This turkey is gonna go on this sheet tray. I roast my turkey on a sheet pan. I've been doing this for years. I feel like it is really effective. I think that it results in a really beautifully golden brown bird. I feel like roasting something alongside of it, in this case, shallots, which I'll then douse in vinegar to serve alongside the turkey. You get plenty of pan drippings to make the gravy, which we're gonna season with mustard and a little bit of soy sauce. It's all you need. People should be seasoning their turkey at least a day in advance. I will be putting the turkey in almost 24 hours to the minute from right now. It could be longer, it could be closer to 36 or 48 hours. It could be shorter, it could be closer to 12 hours if you couldn't do it till later tonight. But to me, 24 hours is like really a sweet spot. You don't want it to go too long, like I wouldn't do like 72 hours because you could like end up basically curing the meat and it can actually get really tough even if you roast it perfectly. Also, do not, please do not season a undefrosted turkey. I'm gonna go ahead and make the dry brine, which is really just a seasoning mixture for the turkey. This is a 16 pound bird. This is definitely on the larger side, anything from 16 to 20 pounds. You wanna err on the side of more seasoning and that can feel scary to people when you're like a half a cup of salt, but this is a really big bird that's gonna feed like 20 people. I like my turkey very peppery and part of that is making sure that your pepper is like pretty coarsely ground. And for those of you that are curious, this is a unicorn pepper mill. I feel like I say that every video, but we still get asked what kind of pepper mill this is. I'm gonna mix this and then we're gonna season our turkey. If you are the kind of person that wants to chop up some, you know, thyme or rosemary or add some crushed fennel seeds into this salt, pepper, sugar mixture, that would be awesome. You would have a delicious bird on your hands. I am a simple person when it comes to the turkey because there's so much going on on the rest of that table. To have your turkey be like blasted with flavor, a flavor blaster, if you will, it feels like kind of like a wasted opportunity. I'd rather have like really intensely flavored sides and a punchy salad and you know, all that stuff. People ask me, is like the organic turkey worth it? Where should I be getting my turkey? And to be honest, I like supporting the butcher near me and I know they have turkey and that's where I like to get it. I don't shame people if like they get a butterball. I don't shame people if they like don't go pick it out from the farm or like whatever. I think it's like, who do you want to support? What do you believe in? I believe in organic turkeys <laughs> and I believe in paisanos. Well, I'm back with more Grey Poupon. Unfortunately this time I don't have any wine, but that's okay because did you know that Grey Poupon is made with wine? It's true. I know you're probably thinking, you love Grey Poupon so much, why don't you marry it? And I've tried and I cannot marry Grey Poupon, but I can cook with it. I actually really love cooking with Grey Poupon. In addition, I'm, as you know, not a sandwich person, so like that's not how I choose to use this condiment, but it's a way to sort of incorporate like acidity and creaminess and saltiness into your foods, just like you would add saltiness using soy sauce or Worcestershire. It's, it's like a beautiful way to season food. So I use them in a lot of things, and a lot of them are really convenient for Thanksgiving. Not just your gravy, but things like salad dressings, obviously, and even like your bechamel for macaroni and cheese. Having mustard in there does so much for the end product. And for me, I feel like the best and most iconic thing is just using it to drag pieces of turkey through, either at the table or the next day, standing in your pajamas, eating that good, good Grey Poupon. When you're making your Thanksgiving shopping list, do not forget to add that Grey Poupon to that list. Uh, and if you somehow forgot or are scrambling to find, you can always visit greatpoupon.com and they can help you out. I'm getting a bowl so I can put the neck and the giblets and stuff in it. So I'm gonna take off his old jacket. I mean, there's a lot of that. You don't want that. A lot of turkeys come tied for you. You can keep it tied if you want. Sometimes I like to untie it and then tie it again or just leave it untied. This turkey is mostly thawed. It's a little frozen inside in the cavity. Nothing we can't fix. On the one side of the cavity, we have the neck. That is to me like the best tasting part of the inside. And on the other side, we have the bag of giblets. Don't forget that they come in two different ends of the turkey because one year I definitely went in just this side, took out the neck and was like, oh, I guess they removed the heart and kidneys and the liver. And I fully roasted a 
bag of innards along with the turkey and I don't recommend it. I'm just gonna let it hang out before I season it for like another 20 minutes just to like, now that I've released him from the bag and he has like a bit of room to breathe at room temp. You do not wanna rinse your turkey under warm water. You do not want to rinse it even under cold water at this point. It will thaw out totally fine. If you can move the legs like this, you're in good shape. I, knock on wood, have never poisoned myself with salmonella, but I don't plan on starting now. Let's season the turkey, that's super easy. Some call it a dry brine, some call it seasoning, some call it a rub, I call it whatever you want me to call it. I, I truly don't care. Dry brine implying that you are seasoning the turkey intensely before you roast it without water. Basically, it's like you're seasoning it with salt, except this is a mixture of salt and sugar and pepper. That sugar is gonna help things caramelize, but it is not a perceptible sweetness, I promise you. So this is the underside of the bird. I'm gonna season it. The magic of a rub like this is that it is highly concentrated. It's also gonna give off a lot of liquid over the next 24 hours, and that is gonna drain through these grates, and we are gonna discard it. Don't forget the butt. <laughs> Grow up, David. No. See, it's already giving off liquid. It's honestly like decorating a cake with sprinkles. You wanna like put the seasoning in your hand and like go like that. Almost like if you've ever built a sand castle. No part of the turkey left unseasoned. We're gonna put this in the fridge. This is a horrible reveal and not much of a glow up. It, it actually like looks the same. I take my turkey out about three hours before I know that I wanna put it in the oven, and this is just to take the chill off, which will give you a more evenly cooked turkey. Part of seasoning protein is drawing moisture out, and that is replacing the water with seasoning. This is just a very large bird, and so there's gonna be more liquid than a chicken. So try not to be freaked out. Understand that it's part of the process. Drain the liquid and move on with your life. This bird is just gonna sit out. We don't need to touch it or do anything to it. And this is just gonna help it cook more evenly when the time comes. If you put a piece of meat this large straight into the oven, the thickest parts are gonna just take that much longer to cook. So giving it a room temp head start is a really, really good idea. I'm leaving this at room temp for as long as it's in the oven. So I'm gonna roast it for about three hours, three and a half, and this'll be out on the counter for two to two to three hours. There's a million ways to roast a turkey. You can roast it hot and then reduce the temperature. You can roast it very low and slow for a very long time. I like somewhere between the two methods. So I go 325, which is not exactly super hot, but it's also not so slow that it's gonna take me six hours because I don't have that kind of time. Roasting this turkey on a sheet pan frees me up to like do a lot of stuff scattered around it. If you have onions, great. If you have leeks, awesome. If you have shallots, even better. Sometimes I'll take a head of garlic, slice it crosswise. You can do this with an onion as well. Just put it in the center and that, that's what your turkey will rest on. Using a vegetable that kind of keeps its structure is a nice, a nice tip. All right, this bird is going on top of here. I'm not trying to put it on top of the shallots. If you'll notice, it's like I made like a picture frame of shallots and the turkey will go inside the picture frame. I'm gonna take this onion and shallot, stuff it inside. And these herbs, this is thyme and oregano. And what does it functionally do again, having the stuff inside? It's just creating like a steamy environment. So it's not just like roasting in the void with like no flavor. It's like if you can add flavor, you should add flavor. I'm also going to put celery leaf that I gathered earlier as also like an aromatic. Anything green is gonna provide just like a really nice moist environment for your turkey instead of feeling like it's drying out over that three hour trip to the oven. We've done the work, it's seasoned. If after it comes out of the oven and you slice it, you feel like it's in need of a bit of a, a kick, you can always finish it with flaky salt, but that's also what gravy's there for. To me, a turkey should be like deeply seasoned throughout, and that's why we do that full 24 hour brine. So I'm not gonna touch it again with any more seasoning. What I will do is drizzle everything on the sheet tray with olive oil, and then maybe give a little salt to the shallots, but that's it. Turkey skin, as I previously mentioned, is really not that rich. It doesn't have a ton of fat. So if you don't give it this like head start moment, you're gonna have a tougher time with golden brown skin and a tougher time, like it's kind of jump starts the rendering process. I stand by my statement that I'm not gonna tuck the wings because I like how crispy these get. And when you tuck them, they sort of just steam behind the breast and you don't get that experience. This year I decided to twine my turkey. Uh, why you may ask? Well, because I have twine sitting on my kitchen counter. I was like, you know what, this year I'm twining. So I'm gonna tie a little string, a little bracelet around his leg, and then I'm crossing it over the other leg, and that's it. 
totally optional for me. The, the pros are it gets the underside of the thigh really nicely browned because you're lifting up the legs. And also it looks really festive when it comes out of the oven. In like an hour and a half, we'll start to baste it. Most of the basting occurs in the last hour of roasting. I think constant basting actually just reduces the oven temperature and makes your turkey roast longer and doesn't benefit the bird or you. But that last hour, especially last like 45 minutes, is like really when the skin starts to get golden brown. Basting it with that fat is gonna help it get really crispy and like that color that we're looking for. Some ovens that heat from the top, you wanna be roasting more towards the bottom. But my oven heats from the bottom, so I wanna be really kind of square in the middle. We'll see you in a bit. I know. I know, she's looking nice. I can temp it right now, but I can already tell that it's not gonna be done. I am gonna drizzle it with a little bit more oil. I'm gonna give it a little bit more salt just for the final like 30 minutes of roasting. There are so many pan drippings under this bird that you cannot see right now that will give us like almost a cup and a half to two cups of liquid. There's a thing that I do while I'm resting the bird is I tip it. And so all of the juices inside of it, the cavity are gonna come out of the bird so they don't end up on your cutting board. And that's what we'll use for the gravy. This is gonna go back in. This turkey has been in the oven for now three and a half hours. I'm gonna take the temperature of this turkey. My opinion with turkey is that I'd rather have a tender, cooked through, like delicious thigh than a perfectly cooked, juicy breast, which is like achievable, but like, that's not why we're here. I'm here for like a shreddy, delicious, like almost braised-ish thigh. If you cook this turkey in this way, as, as in like a whole bird, not spatchcocked or grilled or whatever else people are doing these days, there's like a huge chance that a perfect breast will give you an undercooked leg and thigh. Not inedible, but maybe a little tougher than you want it to be. So I always say, you know what? down for a breast that's like a little bit drier because turkey breast meat is always a little bit dry. You're gonna slice it thin for your sandwich the next day anyway. You're gonna smother it with gravy. You're gonna dip it in these mashed potatoes. It's fine. I'm using this thing called a thermopen. It's a great thermometer. You wanna go into like the deepest part of the thigh because that will be what is cooked last. And sometimes what happens with these turkeys is like the leg meat here might be delicious and tender, but the thigh meat down there, you'll notice it's like, almost bloody, like you're like, how is this possible? This turkey's been in there for four hours. This will give you like a better sense. And we should be getting in around like 160. We're at 155, baby. I'm gonna keep it in for like another 10 to 15. The last bits of cooking happen the fastest. For it to get to 100, you know, or whatever, takes a much longer time than like 155 to 160 is like a much shorter period of time. That's true for all protein. We're at 162, that's great. So I'm gonna let this sit. A lot of that juice will start to come out. So you'll notice that like what juice is on the pan now will almost triple by the time we uh, wanna make our gravy. I am going to tip this bird, but before I do that, I'm gonna take these shallots and I'm gonna put them in this bowl. I'll drizzle them with vinegar and this will be the side dish if we want it to be. Or you can serve them all alongside the turkey or truly whatever. But they're jammy, they're sweet. We're gonna tilt. And a lot of that juice is what's gonna go into our gravy. It's also just like a good way to get it off of your cutting board, which can be really annoying when you're carving a turkey. So this turkey is gonna chill here for a minute while we make the gravy. My gravy is tangy, it's salty, it's acidic, it's well balanced, it's deeply meaty. It utilizes all of the juices that have come out of the turkey that the, they have given you during the roasting period. Normally when you're making a gravy, you take the bits from the roasting pan, which can be quite dry. You deglaze it with some sort of liquid or whatever. This already has that liquid from the inside of our bird. So I wanna make sure that anything that has stuck is coming up and I'm using the you know long part of my spatula here to scrape it up like this. All this is gonna go into this measuring cup. You don't want any like visibly chunky pieces. So you should have about a full cup of pan drippings from that bird. Some might have a little bit more, some might have a little bit less. I'm gonna add some vinegar to these shallots and just kind of let them hang out in this bowl. When you're making your turkey in a sheet pan, you lose that moment in the, in the roasting pan to give you the opportunity to make the gravy in that, which is totally fine because you don't really need it. I'm gonna start with four tablespoons of unsalted butter in this pot. 
I'm gonna melt it to that. I'm gonna add a quarter cup of all-purpose flour. You could use Wondra, which is a fine flour that is typically used exclusively for gravy. Some people swear by it. I think that either will work here, but I'm using regular all-purpose flour. In addition to the one cup of pan drippings, I'm gonna add three cups-ish of turkey broth. I'm gonna start with three cups of liquid total. And that's what I'll use because this is like effectively the pan drippings plus stock, two things you'd be using anyway. And you wanna add this flour before your butter starts to brown. And really what we're doing here is this is like a roux. We're frying flour in fat. And what this does is it toasts flour. So we're making toast. We're making liquid toast. Gravy should be dark and rich, which a lot of will come from our stock and our pan drippings, but taking the roux to like a darker color will also help that color. Anyone who's made a roux, if you've heard people talk about it, like color is directly related to flavor. So the lighter the roux, the more floury it will taste. The darker the roux, the more complex and sort of bitter and toasty it'll taste. As this darkens, it sort of tells me when it wants the liquid to be added, which is now. You wanna do this slowly, and it's gonna look really thick and sort of unmanageable at first, but it's important that you stay patient, stay the course, add your liquid a little bit at a time. This is not unlike making an aioli or mayonnaise. You're adding liquid to fat, and those things take time to properly emulsify and thicken. So this looks good now, but gravy really likes to simmer to thicken up, so I'm gonna add that other cup of stock. And much like mashed potatoes, gravy is kind of like a personal thickness journey. For seasoning purposes, you can go a lot of different ways, but I like to keep it pretty straightforward. I want saltiness in the form of like depth of flavor. So I'm adding soy sauce. I'm wanting some sort of acidity, but without the like punchiness of vinegar. So I'm gonna add mustard. Just with those two ingredients, plus your pan drippings and the stock is like, to me, the fastest and best and most delicious way to gravy. I'm gonna add a little Grey Poupon to the gravy. When you start with really well seasoned turkey stock and the drippings are really well seasoned, you're gonna end up with like a really nicely seasoned gravy from the jump, from the get go. <laughs> I've never in my life said from the jump. So I'm gonna not uh, put away my turkey stock quite yet because sometimes what happens is once you bring the gravy to a boil and you simmer it, it can get thickened really quickly, thicker than you want. So I'm gonna keep it on hand just close by in case I feel like, say we don't eat for another hour and a half and the gravy thickens too much. I can always add a little bit of stock to thin it out. I added some time to the gravy to just like simmer along with it. I'm just gonna like reduce the heat. So for this bird, first of all, I'm gonna untie it. Just like you would carve a chicken, that's how we're gonna tackle this turkey. Wow, tackle this turkey. How is this the first time I've said that? So this turkey will tell you where it wants to go. This skin here, clearly can be freed from the bird, like that. I see some juices in there, they're running clear. I mean, she's cooked, it's great. This thigh joint makes things a bit more complicated, but not impossible. So same thing on this leg. As long as you get down to that bone and then encourage it. It's a little gruesome, I'm not gonna lie, but it's what your turkey will look like too. <laughs> So this is where the breastbone is, you can see it. And you basically wanna make your knife run on either side of it to cut each breast free. So you wanna go down to the breastplate, basically, which is a piece of cartilage that you'll feel. Gently, slowly, tenderly, stay as close to that piece of cartilage as possible to free the breast. Free the breast. Also, I don't want anyone to panic that pink is a sign of underdoneness. We've tempted this bird in three different places and also dry barning it overnight will sometimes change the color of skin, especially in a turkey. So please don't let that freak you out. The turkey butt, not that good to eat, to be honest. I hate a juicy cutting board, so I'm gonna take care of this in the sink. I'm separating the leg from the thigh, like so. Kind of take the bone out. So I'm gonna throw this thigh bone back into the pot with the carcass, along with any like sort of inedible parts of turkey because they will make good broth. I'm a big fan of keeping that whole, unless absolutely positive that you're gonna eat all that meat. That looks really good. Yeah, that looks great. Thanks guys. I think for me, the moral of the story with turkey is like, if your gravy's great and the turkey is seasoned well, you're all set. A little pepper, some of this extra jus. This is just some oregano that I grew in my garden. <laughs> and that is our star of the show. It's our turkey, it's our gravy, it's our turkey and gravy. Thank you to Grey Poupon for sponsoring this video.